Hi, and welcome to this section of the Chemistry Tutor. In this section, we're going to cover the topic of hydrate compounds. Uh, so one thing you've got to get through uh, to yourself in chemistry is that almost everything has a very intimidating sounding name. This is one of them, hydrate compounds. It sounds, whoa, what's this? It's a new type of compound, so complicated. You're going to find out here it's very, very simple. Um, ask yourself, what does the word hydrate mean? If you're riding a bike and you need to hydrate yourself, what does it mean? It means you need water. So hydrate compounds somehow involve water. What it basically boils down to is a, a hydrate compound. I could write this on the board, but it's really so simple there's no need to. A hydrate compound is just an ionic compound, which is what we've been talking about the last couple sections. It's a regular old ionic compound with a fixed number of water molecules tied up in the lattice structure. Uh, in other words, you might have you know, calcium chloride or something like that, and it's a regular arrangement of calcium and chlorine ions in a, in a rectangular rigid lattice, right? But if you add a little water to that guy, then it might soak in through the lattice and you might have a regular arrangement of water molecules kind of stuck in there. The water is not really um, part of the ionic compound. It's really just kind of stuck in the lattice with it, basically, is what it amounts to. And they're most commonly formed, I mean, you can, if you go to a chemical supply house, I guess what I'm trying to say is you'll usually see these hydrate compounds uh, for you to get to use in your experiments. But usually in nature, they're really formed if you have, let's say you have a solution like a pond or something or like a puddle that has some, uh, you know, things dissolved in it, some calcium, some, some uh, you know, carbonate ions or something like that. And then over time it evaporates. So then when you get down to the end, what you're left with is a, the powdery crystal that's kind of like the result of these two ions that have reacted together. So they were in solution. Kind of like if you go into an underground cavern or underground cave, you'll see the beautiful arrangements of the stalagmites and the stalactites. Well, those are, are uh, crystalline in nature and they were at once dissolved in water. Over time, the water goes away and evaporates, but what's left behind is the ionic compound. Well, if you take one of those and look under a microscope, you'll find that inside of the lattice structure of your ionic compound, there's also water molecules there. So if you start out with a dissolved solution of ions and let it all evaporate away, a lot of times what you'll be left with is really a hydrated compound, a hydrate compound, which means it's a regular old ionic compound, but there's water kind of inside the lattice. So the easiest way to kind of get this across to you is to just show you how they're written. So if I have calcium chloride, we've talked about how to name these things, CaCl2. This is nothing special, it's exactly the way you would write it if you just had calcium combining with chlorine, right? But if it's a hydrate, it might have six water molecules uh, in there. The dot, it's not multiplication, it just means, look, here's the ionic compound, okay, break. Now I have six quantity of six of these water molecules. So what it basically means is that for every one of these guys, I have six of these water molecules. So if you could get a microscope and zoom in on this this crystal lattice, you'd see the calcium and the chlorine, but you'd see water kind of tied up in the lattice also. It's not really participating in this ionic compound per se, it's just kind of in there, usually due to the way the thing was formed. So it's more or less not something that you should memorize which, which of these ionic compounds readily form hydrates. It's more that once you see one of these hydrated things, you don't, you don't get worried about it, you don't think that it's something hard. That's really why I'm bringing it up. The way that you would name this would be calcium chloride. So, so far it's exactly the same, calcium chloride. And here you have to deal with this. We call it hexahydrate, hexahydrate. The hexa means six, the hydrate means water. That's all it means. So this is very important. You might be asked this on an exam. Or if you practice chemistry in the future, you might just need to know this. So calcium chloride hexahydrate. That means six uh, water uh, molecules tied up in there. Uh, what about BaCl2 dot 2H2O? That means that I have this barium chloride, but for every one of these formula units, I have two water molecules somewhere nearby. So this is barium the barium comes from here, chloride coming from here. Here I have dihydrate. 
right? The dihydrate comes from the fact that there's two of them, di meaning two. So it's using the same basic prefixes from what we have used in the past for the molecular compounds, basically. What if I have lithium, ClO4, and three water molecules? Okay, how would this be done? Well, it's lithium, and what is this polyatomic ion? We've talked about that. You could find, probably find your table of polyatomic ions in your book and see that ClO4 is perchlorate. So this is lithium perchlorate. Lithium perchlorate trihydrate. Okay, so lithium perchlorate trihydrate. So if I asked you before that we started this chemistry course, uh, do you have any idea what lithium perchlorate trihydrate is? And you'd be like, what? That's just a really crazy sounding thing, but it's pretty easy now. Lithium is right here. The perchlorate polyatomic ion is listed right here. Three waters tied up within the lattice structure is the trihydrate part. Okay, give you another quick example. Um, we have some magnesium here, some CO3 dotted with 5 H two O. So we have five water molecules in the lattice for every one of these formula units here. Now, what would this be named? This is just simply magnesium. What is this? CO3, we've been using this one a lot, and you can also see in your book, is carbonate. All right, so it's magnesium carbonate. What about this? We have five waters. The prefix for five is penta, so it's pentahydrate. pentahydrate. Okay. So now that we have done that, I've given you the hydrate compound and we have named it. Let's go in reverse and let's write down a, uh, a hydrate name and let's write the formula. Okay. And we're basically going to do exactly the same thing in reverse. So this is, let's say we have barium iodide dihydrate. Barium iodide dihydrate. So first we have to do this part, the ionic part. So we do the D, the BA for barium, the iodide, the iodine for, for the iodine. What is the charge on barium? Barium likes to take plus two charge. What is the charge on iodine? It likes to have a negative one charge. So we just do crisscross. So we get BA1 from here, I2 from here. So that takes care of that. Uh, dihydrate. Di means two, so it's 2H2O. So BAI2 dot 2H2O. So you see, it's really not that hard. Hydrates are actually not that hard, but I remember the first time I saw one of them, I was like, what does this mean? It doesn't even make any sense. What about aluminum bromide hexahydrate? So if on a test you see aluminum bromide hexahydrate, pretty simple. Take aluminum, take bromine, and now we have to figure out the ionic part of the compound here. Bromine is always going to have a negative one charge. You can see that on the periodic table. Aluminum, you'll probably end up memorizing. It always wants to have a plus three charge. Somewhere in your book, there'll probably be a table of these transition metals. Aluminum usually just likes to form plus three. So we'll do the crisscross, and we'll have Al, the one coming from here, three going here, Br3. So aluminum bromide is right here. Hexahydrate, hexa means six H2O. So AlBr3 uh, hexahydrate there. And finally, we have zinc sulfate heptahydrate. Okay, zinc sulfate heptahydrate. So zinc is Z-N sulfate. When you go look at your table of polyatomic ions, we've used that one a lot. Sulfate is SO4. All right, so that's what our base is going to be. Um, when we look at our table, polyatomic ion for sulfate, it's always going to want to be negative two. And if you look at zinc, uh, it's always going to also want to be plus two. Somewhere in your, in your book, there should be a table of transition elements. Zinc is one of them, and it is one of them that usually just likes to form one 
uh, one ion, so we know it's going to be plus two. So we drag this here, we drag this here, so we'll have Zn2SO42. But we know that's not the right answer because here we have a ratio of two zincs to two sulfate ions. And we can reduce that. We divide by two, divide by two. So we'll get Zn, and we'll just write it as SO4 because it's now become one to one. But we still have heptahydrate, so we put a dot. Hepta means seven H. Two, oh, so seven waters, zinc, uh, sulfate, heptahydrate. And that's basically it, ladies and gentlemen. There's really no point in continuing doing a lot of additional problems with hydrates because it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Everything in the beginning of the guy, the, the actual um, ionic part of it, behaves with all the rules of naming ionic compounds that we've done so far, including all the polyatomic ion part of it. After that, we just stick a uh, H2O on there with however many water molecules are bound up. Now you're not expected to know that uh, lithium perchlorate is going to have three waters tied up in its lattice. You're not supposed to know that. That's not something that's even in our books. Usually it's not something that we memorize. All you're going to be expected to do is to see one of these guys to be able to name it and if you see one of these names to be able to write its chemical formula down. That's all we're, we're really doing right now. So I hope that this has really opened your eyes on that. I hope that this DVD course has really helped you uh, to, to learn how to appreciate chemistry and to realize that it's not just a collection of random things, that nature really does follow rules. And once we understand those rules, then we can do things like understand what ammonium uh, or aluminum bromide hexahydrate or heptahydrate will do. I mean, that's a really complicated sounding thing, but once you know the rules, breaking it up step by step, you can do this chemistry. And uh, so it seems very intimidating, very difficult, very hard at first, but once you understand the rules, which I hope that we've been able to help you with here, you'll be able to do these things. And often the next DVD course, we'll really start getting into chemical reactions, taking things together, combining them, see how much of a product is going to be produced, calculating how much product is going to produce, calculating which of the two reactants that I started with is going to run out first. Which one's going to be my limiting reactant that's going to stop the reaction first? Things like that. And then we'll go down into, into continuing our journey down chemistry one step at a time. I'm Jason. I hope you've enjoyed the course. Watch this as many times as you need. And I guarantee you that if you understand this material and the material that follows, you'll do very well in your, in your chemistry class, on your AP exams, in high school, in college, in all of this material here.